Hello, this is Mr. Anderson for Kellogg Community College, and I am going to be talking today about uh, looking at t-tests. And I'm going to compare them versus the p-test for small sample size, or sample size under 30. Now, just like you saw in the previous video, we are taking a look at small sample sizes where we should be using the t-chart instead of the z-chart. The t-chart is for a family of small curves, and this is going to help us find uh, whether our hypothesis test is making a type 1 error or not. But I want to actually compare and contrast, just like I did before with the z-tests and their p-test equivalents. I want to now uh, do that with um, t-tests. Now, just like the, um, the t-tests have a null and an alternative hypothesis. Well, so do the p-tests. That isn't this. That isn't any different. And in the previous video, what we would do is we would find. Oops, hold on. We would find the critical value, and we would find the critical value by looking at the sample size and then figuring out our degrees of freedom from that. And obviously, asking about what kind of tail it is, whether it was one tail or two tail. And this is also based on the alpha that we were given. Uh, in step three, we would uh, find the test value. Um, by using the uh, t value formula. So the test value would be our t equals equation. Um, and then after that we would draw a picture. And we would create a critical region based on the critical value and see if our t value uh, was inside or outside of that or not. Now if it was, now for our summary we would then talk about what we just saw because if the t value was outside of the critical region uh, then it would be uh, too small and we would say well shoot it looks like we're not going to reject the null hypothesis but if it's inside the critical region uh, then we're saying like okay it looks like we are in the dark zone this is a good thing we're going to reject the null hypothesis well in the p-test the second step isn't actually finding the critical value the second step is to find the test value or the t from the t equals equation. Um, we are then going to try to compare that t value to the alpha percentage. Now what we're about to then do is to go to the table and what I like doing is calling this the ride the rail. Ride the rail and this has nothing to do with railroading but it has to do with how we look at our table once we get our t value. Then we evaluate, and evaluation is um, a little bit easier with the uh, t-test table than it was with the z-test table because evaluation is just asking are we under the alpha score. And if we're under the alpha score, uh, the good news is if we're under the alpha score, we're going to reject the null hypothesis. And in our summary, we will say that. But if we are over the alpha, then we are not going to reject the null hypothesis. So let's actually get into an example and show you what's what. So for this example, we're going to look at this problem where a, phys a physical physician, he's claiming that Jogger's maximal volume is greater than the average you know, adult maximum volume. So he's making a pretty easy claim that if you are a jogger then you're gonna, your lungs are going to have more lung capacity through the exercise than someone who's normal. So what he did is took a sample, a very small sample of 15 joggers, so there's going to be our n here. Our n is 15. That's important to know because we're going to have to look up degrees of freedom. And we notice that there is a mean of 40.6, so I'm going to call that my mu there. But actually, this is probably best instead of uh, my mu, I'm going to call this my x bar right there. And I'm going to call my x bar because this is the sample from the small group and um, the standard deviation from that small group, which I'm going to call a lowercase s, that is going to be uh, the standard deviation there. Now, I use a little cursive S instead of a, 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 my lowercase S's look like fives, so I use a cursive letter S. If the average of all adults is 36.7, so there's my, uh, there's my mu right there. I'm going to get my mu. Um, if my 
Average of the adults is 36.7. Is there enough evidence to support the physician's claim with an alpha of 0.05? Cool, so now we know our, our alpha. And again, a lot of times um, in the book, they sometimes don't mention alpha in p-tests, and you would just assume it was 5%. But I've also seen the newer editions of the book use other alphas other than 5%. So this is um, something you would always look to check to see if you're under this percent when using your p-test. So let's actually get down to to business and let's do the Z test. Oh, I wrote Z instead of T. I apologize. Let's do the T test and let's do that T test for this small sample size. Uh, and we're going to rock our, our uh, null hypothesis. Our null hypothesis is going to say, oh no, the average of joggers and people alike is 36.7. There's no difference. But the alternative is to say, oh no, we're going to test to see if this physician's claim that their volume is greater than the average person, that average is greater than 36.7. So there's your test, null, your t-test null and alternative. This is definitely a right tail. So when we do our critical value check in problem number two, in part two, we're going to remember the facts here, that this is right tail. And not only is it right tail, we have to look up 14 degrees of freedom. So 14 degrees of freedom and a right tail test, what I'm going to need to do is kind of get to our T table, which I happen to have here uh, that we can quickly go to on the screen. So let us switch over to the, there we go. So there's our T table. Um, if I look at 14 degrees of freedom, and then I scroll on over to see where there is, you know, a one tail at 5%. So let me do a quick little circle here. This is one tail at 5% right there. And we're at 14 degrees of freedom. So this is here. So if we look down from the 0.05 and over from the 14, we get our 1.761 uh, as our critical value. So as long as our test value is over 1.761, we're going to reject the null hypothesis. So let's go back to the other page. Let me click on this here. All right, get back to my pen and start inking away here. Okay, so that was 1.761. And now what we will do is use our test this is our uh, t-test formula, and our t-test formula is x bar minus mu divided by uh, lowercase s for the standard deviation of that small group divided by the sample size. So this is going to be 40.6 minus 36.7 divided by 6 divided by square root of 15. All right, so we have that there. If we compute that value, this gives me 2 and 52 hundredths. So I'm going to draw a little picture here. I'm sorry this is going to get a little cramped, but I wanted to show all of this in one screenshot here. So here's our uh, normal curve, and our critical value is at 1.61 if this is 1 and 2 standard deviations away from the norm. And this is a right tail test, so we're going to shade to the right here, and that 1.761 is my um, is my you know, start of the critical region for right tail, because you see this is shaded to the right. Now my 2.52 is right here, and so it looks like my test value is inside the critical region, so since, this is my step five, since 2.52 is greater than 1.761, we will reject the null hypothesis. Because that null hypothesis was saying that, no, everybody's the same, but we just found a small group that was so many standard deviations away from the norm that this can't possibly be true for the, jo the joggers. Joggers have a maximum, uh, maximal volume greater than the average uh, adult. Now that was the t-test. Now the t-test was again shown um, several times in a previous video. So how would a p-test differ from this? Well, it wouldn't differ at all in terms of its null and alternative hypothesis here. So mu is equal to 36.7 and mu is greater than 36.7. So there's the null and the alternative. Now for step two, it's going to be the same as step three. So you would use this formula and get your test value or t value of 2.52. Now what we're going to do is we're going to compare this to the um, we're going to compare this to 
the actual t-chart and then look to see if it fit in our 5% alpha threshold. Now to do that, I'm gonna bring back the um, bring back the T distribution table right here, and I'm gonna to get to my um, get to my view, get to my review. Let's do some inking here. All right, so here's what you're gonna do. You're gonna look at 14 degrees of freedom because we know that because our sample size is 15. And what I'd like to do is I'd like to kind of draw a line if I could at that place, okay? So now I'm looking at all the values in that row of 14. Um, I would strongly suggest that you write on your formula sheet that I give you on the day of the test. That way you can make sure that you don't accidentally skip a line. But where you have to go is to remember that we landed at 2.52. Now 2.52 is right here, 2.52. And I know that because it's between this score, which is 2.145, and it's between this score, which is 2.624. Um, you're never gonna have the problem of landing right on one of these numbers. You're always gonna be between the two numbers. And this is what I mean, ride the rail. Like follow the squiggle up to where it says one tail. Okay, so I followed the squiggle up to where it says one tail, because this is a right tail test. Now you get to look and evaluate to see if you're under 5%. And I am very much between 2.5% and I'm very much between 1%. So if I'm between 2.5% and 1%, then I, in the one tail row, then I'm definitely under 5%. So I'm going to reject the null hypothesis. So I'm going to come back to this in just a bit. But again, to review what we just did, if I am at 14 degrees of freedom, I slide over until my T value or test value is between two of these numbers. And then I skate up the table and check to see where I am for the appropriate number of tails. And this tells me, oh man, I'm between these two values. So since I'm between these two values and those values are both under 5%, and I would be under 5% if that was the case, um, then I'm gonna reject the null hypothesis. So now I just have to go back to the other Word document and I did, and you can see that I'm actually not gonna write anything down here. I'm just going to, to put down um, like nothing here because honestly, if you wanna write, hey, I got an idea. If you wanna write something in your notes to kind of go over what you said, just to make sure you watch this video. Here, let's write down what you did. You put your finger on 14 degrees of freedom and slid to where the T, sorry, the T, uh, I'm sorry, that has a little, I'll rewrite that over here, where the T score is between two numbers. And that's what you did. You put your finger on degrees of freedom and slid to where the T-score is between two numbers. Now, for number four, we did check to see if we were under 5%. Were we under 5%? And we definitely were under 5%. So the reality is, since we are under 5%, we, whoops, looks like my pen's glitching here. We will reject the null hypothesis. All right, there it is. Since we are under 5%, we will reject the null hypothesis. Now, I do wanna go back to that table for a moment and, and just kind of erase a little bit of what we did and, and kind of talk about the table a little bit more in depth since this is my last example here. So if I go here, click my eraser and get rid of some of this stuff here, a couple common questions occur um, because we have sometimes a, some snazzy situations show up. Like let's say we had, oops, hold on, boop. Let's say we had nine degrees of freedom. So I'm gonna kind of look at this row here, nine degrees of freedom. And um, what if I found that my T value was uh, 2.1? If my T value is a 2.1, that would put me here between 1.83 and 2.262 for nine degrees of freedom. 
it is really important to know what your tail is on this problem. Now on the Z charts, you had to do a whole lot of calculations when you had one tail versus two tail. But what's nice about the T charts here versus the Z charts that we did in the previous videos is that you this actually takes care of like your, your decision making. So what if this was a two tail test? Well then you would go up to here into this spot right there and I'm gonna fill in the circle and now you would probably not reject the null hypothesis because if the alpha is 5% you would definitely be between 5 and 10% and that would put you over the 5% so you would not reject the null hypothesis but if this is a one tail test and I'm gonna put this by the square up here if this is a one tail test with that 2.1 score here you would reject the null hypothesis because you're going to be between five and two and a half percent and you're under that. So we've seen that a, a couple times before uh, where not knowing how many tails you have is going to make a difference in what you suggest and what you do here. So again, uh, be very cognizant of what your alpha is and how many tails it is. There's a couple homework problems too where your um, Let's say you are at, uh, let me erase this here. Uh, boom, 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 boom. Erase, erase, erase. Okay, goodbye, goodbye, goodbye. Okay, so let's say you were at maybe 17 degrees of freedom, okay? And you get a T score that's like four. So it would be like way over here. Well, if you there's no rail over here, but if you went up, you'd notice no matter how many tails you'd have, you definitely would probably be under the threshold they were looking for. So with four standard deviations away from the null, no you're, you're definitely going to reject the null hypothesis. So if I have to leave you with one thing at the end of this video, if you're under the alpha, if you found that when you rode your rail and landed where you needed to be, let's say you landed there, and the alpha was 5%, look, you're under 5%. You are going to reject the null hypothesis. But let's say you rode the rail and ended up here, and the alpha was 10%, well, shoot, you are going to not reject the null hypothesis because you would be over 10%, in this case, between 10 and 20%. So these P scores can get a little tricky, and I hope this video has kind of cleared some things up for you. And uh, then again, uh, you know, I'm always available for my students in email, and I appreciate you watching these videos. Thank you very much.